fellow bookworms to Tibra's Den. My name is Whitney and we are reading V.C. Andrews, My Sweet Audrina. Before we jump into discussing this book, of course I want to go over the other things we are reading currently. We are doing our series Saturday to continue on with the Dresden Files. So we are reading Full Moon. Our first video is up this past Saturday where we discuss the first six chapters and then of course we are reading the next set of chapters and you can find the breakdown down in the description below or over on my website and we will be discussing the next set of chapters this Saturday. So hopefully you are participating. If not, you know, grab a copy. If you haven't read Stormfront yet, get it first, read it, and then jump right into Full Moon. But really, these are such enjoyable books and I hope you will participate with us. And then of course, I do want to discuss our weekly reads. Um, we are finishing up Witch and w Wizard by James Patterson and Gabrielle Charbonnet. And we will be discussing this this Wednesday, so definitely make sure you check back. Um, if you're not subscribed already, do subscribe and hit the bell notification. And then this Wednesday, we are going to start reading Goddess of the Night by Lynn Ewing, which is the first in the Daughters of the Moon series. Um, we are only reading this one book. This is the only book I have of that series, and it was gifted to me. But definitely excited to read that, and we'll start that, like I said, this Wednesday. And then, of course, just to make sure you have time to pick it up if you would like to, I'm going to introduce the next weekly read, which will be the week of September 15th. And we are going to be reading Anna's Story by Jenna Bush. Um, this is our first nonfiction read, and I do hope you'll participate um, regardless of your political views or anything like that. I think this is a really important story that she is telling. And so I do hope you will participate with us. I'm just going to read the little synopsis for you guys real quick so you can kind of get an idea of what the book is about. But it says, she's 17, she's been abused, she has a child, and she's HIV positive. She is Anna, and this is her story. It begins the day she is born, infected with HIV, transmitted from her young mother. Now she barely remembers her mama, who died when Anna was only three. From then on, Anna's childhood becomes a blur of faint memories and secrets. Secrets about her illness and then about the abuse, the abuse she endures. Anna's journey is a long one. Shuffled from home to home, she rarely finds safety or love. And then she meets a boy. Birdo is one of the only people Anna trusts with all her secrets. That trust puts Anna on a path to breaking the silence that has harmed her and leads her to new beginnings, new sorrows, and new hope. Jenna Bush has written a powerful narrative, nonfiction account of a girl who struggles to break free from the vicious cycle of abuse, poverty, and illness. Based on Jenna's work with UNICEF and inspired by the framework of One Girl's Life, it is also the story of many children around the world who are marginalized and excluded from basic care, support, and education. Resources at the back of the book share how you can make a difference to children in need and how you can protect yourself and others. So, like I said, this is going to be the read for September 15th, and this gives you time to pick up a physical copy if you like, but there are links below where you can order this, and hopefully I'll see, and I'll link it below, but you might be able to get this on Kindle or audiobook, um, however you prefer I hope you'll get a copy and read along with us. And you might even be able to find it at your local library. I'm not sure, but it never hurts to check out your library for these weekly reads just to see. And that way you can participate without buying the book if you don't want to. So, but anyway, that's it for our weekly reads and our series Saturday. Let's go ahead and get back into the book of the month. Um, and so I will just say that this is kind of a heavier book and it does deal with an assault of a child um, and a lot of kind of abuse and just toxic behavior in general. So it is a heavier one, but I do hope you will read it with me again because there's a lot of important things, important talking points in this book. So this week we read chapter, well, chapters one through seven. They're not numbered. So I did break it down by page numbers. So this week we read pages one or three through 20, 126. Getting all my numbers mixed up, but pages three through 126 are what we read this week. And those are the pages and those chapters that we are going to be discussing. 
So first up, of course, is chapter one, which is called White Fern. There's a lot of toxicity in this household. What stands out the most? And for me, I mean, there's just so much going on and so much that's like, what the heck is going on here? Um, but for me, the thing that stood out the most was just the overall interactions mm -hmm. between the characters. You have your... Audrina, of course, is the main character. You have her father, her mother, her aunt, and her aunt, a legitimate child. So um, that's kind of the premise of the book. And those are the characters we're dealing with. And just the way they interact, like, they're just so cruel to each other. Um, and just so toxic to each other that it's really kind of heartbreaking. Um, and so that's probably the biggest one that stands out to me. Um, but there's also a lot of other issues going on. So, again, excuse the puppy. Um, she's, she's just noisy. She likes to talk. But the next question is, there are a lot of outdated views, mainly regarding women, illegitimate child, weight gain, role of a, of a wife, if the book had been written today, would those views still be included? And I think they would. So this book was originally published in 1982. And some of these views are even outdated for that time period. Um, and so I really think it's just kind of part of the characters and, and their toxicity. So I do think that it would still be included if she wrote it today. Um, just because I do think it's kind of showcasing how toxic these people really are and how outdated they are. Um, so I don't think it would have changed anything whether it was written today, you know, in 82 or even farther back. I think those still would have been in place regardless. The next chapter is called In the Cupola. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, excuse me. But... Vera goes above and beyond normal sisterly bullying. Why is she so mean to Audrina? And so obviously they're not sisters. They're cousins, but, um, you know, they're, they're raised together. Well, sort of. They have to kind of be portrayed as sisters. Like, she, uh, Vera is illegitimate, and so, um, you know, they obviously all live in the same household, and to the community, they think Vera is Audrina's sister. So that's kind of a, what, you know, I say, a sisterly bullying. Um, but I think, you know, she just, I don't know, like, maybe she's a little bit resentful of Audrina. You know, she has to keep pretending, you know, to have what Audrina has, but she doesn't actually have that. Like, she's not you know, their child. She's not Audrina's sister, but she has to pretend. So she's probably a little bit resentful, and I think maybe of the attention Audrina gets as well. She probably resents a little bit as, you know, as well. So, um, and also I think just kind of the person she is, like, she's just a very toxic person, and as is her mother, um, and just kind of the environment she's being raised in is very toxic, and so she kind of takes that toxicity out on the only person she can, which is Audrina. And the next question, Vera easily gets hurt and frequently breaks bones. Why isn't she more cautious? And I think she probably likes the attention. Um, you know, a lot of the attention she does get is very negative in nature. And so I think, you know, when she gets hurt, um, she gets some positive attention and she gets some care. Um, and so I think, you know, it kind of, like, yeah, it's not fun breaking bones or getting hurt, but at the same time, she's not overly cautious because it gets her attention, you know, just kind of like how people, um, you, you know, fake illnesses and, and fake getting hurt. Like, yeah, she's legitimately hurt, but it gets her the attention that she doesn't get otherwise, uh, I think. So next up is chapter three, which is titled Papa's Dream. In a society based around time, do you agree with Audrina's father that it is healthier to forget about time? And on a certain level, I do agree with him, but not to the extreme he has taken it. I think you still need to be aware of time, but just not so focused on it, you know, like, so, you know, on the weekends and when you don't have responsibilities, you know, kind of maybe be a little bit more relaxed about Oh, I don't need to do this at this time, you know. You can just kind of go with the flow of the day. 
um, where he kind of takes it to a whole new level. Um, so I do agree with it, but not to a level he takes it, which I think his level is, is toxic, um, but I do kind of agree with it somewhat. So, Adrina struggles with her memory. How does the way her family lives affect this? And it's almost like they purposely want to keep her having holes in her memory and kind of keep her confused because um, they don't allow calendars. The clocks are all the wrong times. Like, it's, it's almost like they're purposely, you know, making it harder for her to kind of grasp reality, um, which I think is, again, very toxic. Like, this whole book is just so toxic. Um, and so I think it definitely affects, you know, her memory in a negative way. Like, it's not helping her be more aware or grasp to what's happening around her in any way, shape, or form. So, next up is chapter four, which is the rocking chair. Why does Damon go back and forth with the way he treats Vera? And so, honestly, Damon is Audrina's father, or Damien, however you want to say it. And honestly, he's not very stable with anyone, I don't think. Like, his emotions kind of are all over the place, even with Audrina, um, and even with his wife. He doesn't seem to really like the sister, uh, Audrina's aunt, very much at all. But he's kind of all over the place anyway. Um, and I think with Vera, you know, I, I have a theory but at this point, it hasn't been proved, so um, I think, you know, that's not his child, and he's having to take responsibility for her and her mother, um, which maybe causes some resentment there as well. And then also, I think a lot of Vera's actions are also toxic, and, you know, again, not victim blaming or anything like that, but I think that does affect how he treats her as well because he knows that, you know, she lies and um, does all these cruel things. And so I think, you know, that kind of affects the way he treats her as well. So, and the next question, contrary to what he says, Damien is pushing Audrina to be like the first. Do you think he recognizes that she is a separate person from the first Audrina? And I think on a certain level he does, but I honestly feel like he kind of muddles it. And I have another theory, but I'm not sure. I'm not going to bring it up yet because when I've read the other books in the past, I kind of, you know, have these theories and they don't always come to light. Like, I'm always kind of close, but not quite. Um, and so I think, you know, on some level he does recognize that it's not the same Audrina, but it kind of gets muddled in his mind. And I don't know if he truly believes that, you know, she can, like, this Audrina is an, her own individual. and But she can get some of the special gifts that made the other Audrina so special. Or if he kind of has it muddled and is hoping, you know, the first Audrina can kind of come back to him a little bit through this Audrina. Like, I'm not really entirely sure on that. Um, but I do think on some level he does recognize that she's a separate person from the first Audrina, but it, it's kind of muddled for sure. And then chapter five is called Tuesday Tea Time. The house is full of ghosts. Why do they continue to hold on to the first Audrina and Aunt Mercy Marie? And so I do understand them clinging, you know, to the memory and the ghost of the first Audrina. You know, she was their child and that was probably very traumatic losing her. Um, especially in the way they did, but Aunt Mercy May really confuses me, or Marie. I keep wanting to call her May. I do it while I'm reading too. It's May in my mind, but her name is Aunt Mercy Marie. Um, and I'm a little confused as far as who she is. Like, is she, uh, their aunt or was she their sister? She's Audrina's aunt. Was she related to Damien? Like, I'm really confused as far as who she is. Um, but I'm not really sure why they're clinging to her other than she seems like maybe she was a cruel person, the best I can figure out. And so they're kind of taking out all that anger and such through these fake interactions with her. Um, and so that's my best guess is why they keep clinging on to her. So I really, I'm really confused as far as that whole point at this time in the book. So I don't know. Um, and then let's see, 
Based on this tea time, this is the most relaxed we have seen Lucietta and Elsbeth. Why is this? And the bourbon probably didn't hurt anything. Like, that's probably helping them be a little bit more lax and, you know, relaxed overall. Um, but also I think just kind of the nature, like, it's kind of like a playtime for them. Um, and they're able to get kind of like their resentments and such out under the guise of pretending um, even though it's obviously very real resentments and anger and such that they're getting out. Um, and so I think they're just not having to put on that front. Even though I don't really think they put on one anyway, um, but they can really, really go all out um, and not have to worry about the repercussions or anything like that. So that allows them to be a little bit more relaxed than they typically would be, I think. So next up is chapter six which is called Lions and Lambs. As cruel as Vera is, do you have any sympathy for her? And it doesn't excuse her personal behavior, but I do really feel bad for Vera. Um, again, she's having to pretend, you know, that she has this mother and this father and a sister while her own mother is very, very mean to her. Um, and then she doesn't get the love from the other two because they're focused on Audrina. Um, and El uh, Lucietta actually seems kind of more indifferent to her. And then Damien kind of goes back and forth between being nice to her and being extremely cruel to her. Um, and so I think, you know, she just, she doesn't get a whole lot of attention. Um, and she, she doesn't get a whole lot of love from the people around her. And they're even kind of mean to her. And so I do kind of feel bad for her. Uh, for sure. So, Vera's eyes being like Papa's is brought up multiple times. Could this be a clue to something? And I actually think it is. Again, I hesitate to bring up this theory, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway because it's kind of funny, you know, looking back on what I think is going to happen and what I think connections are um, once I finish reading the book. And I think maybe he's actually is Vera's father. Like, I think that you know hit her having his eyes like maybe he had an affair with you know Elsbeth and so um you know obviously he's married to Lucietta um and hopefully loves her um and but slept with Elsbeth and got her pregnant um and so that's my theory based on how many times her eyes being like Papa's is brought up um, is that he is actually Vera's real father, um, but they just kind of deny that, uh, even though they're also pretending that he is her father. Like, it's very confusing. Like, this whole book is very twisted. <laughs> That's all I got. So, uh, let's see here. Next, we are on to chapter seven, which is Arden Low. We meet Arden and his mom. As Audrina wonders, what interest would a boy of 12 have with a girl of seven? And so at first, their first interaction with each other, I kind of got like creepy feelings um, just because like certain things he said and kind of how he acted. I was a little confused, you know, because it says she's seven. Um, and one, I'm wondering if she's not older than they're telling her because she doesn't really know her real age. Like they don't really tell her that. And so I'm wondering if maybe she's not older than they're saying to her. And if it's not like a, like, if he's not being indecent on his part, I think, which I kind of am getting more as I read this chapter, was that he's just kind of a kind soul. And so I think he just kind of feels bad for her. So if she is a seven-year-old, you know, maybe he just feels bad for her because she's so isolated. She doesn't go to school. Um, I think he kind of has a sense of how mean Vera is. And so I think he just feels bad for her and is just trying to show her some kindness and be a friend. And I hope I'm correct in that and that's not going to turn later on in the rest of the chapters. But that's just kind of my thought as I read more of the chapters and more interactions between them. It's like he's just, he's a kind soul and he does feel bad. And so he reaching out and trying to be nice to her. But And the last question, Audrina is caught by her papa in a compromising position. As angry as he was, do you think he believed her? And I think he did. Um, you know, obviously he was very, very upset. I'm not going to talk about specifics just in case, 
you're not quite up, caught up and you are still reading this video, but he was very, very upset. And so you're still reading this video. <laughs> you're still watching this video, but you haven't read these chapters yet. Um, and then if you have read the chapters, you know what I'm talking about. But anyway, not reading the video, watching the video. Um, I think, like I said, he was very upset but he knows how cruel Vera can be um, and how, you know, tricky, like she tries to play tricks and such um, and get Audrina in trouble. So I think he recognizes that. And yes, he's angry, you know, because he told her not to go to the woods and not to interact with Arden and his mom um, because they're kind of beneath them. And, but I think he does recognize that. And then also... At the end, he agrees that she can still see him on a weekly basis. And if he truly thought there was something going on, I don't think he would have allowed that at all. So I think, you know, he was just upset to find his daughter in the situation she was in. Um, and was just really angry about that, especially when she wasn't even supposed to be there interacting with his boy at all or in the woods at all. So that's kind of my thought is that he does believe her because he knows the kind of person Vera is and then he agrees to let her continue to see him uh, and his mom which he wouldn't have if he truly believed something was going on so that's kind of my thoughts on that but that is it for this set of chapters this week we are reading chapters 127 well pages 127 through uh, 262 which are, I don't remember, the, the description is down below, but it's chapter 8 on. Um, and so yeah, 127 through 262. Those are the pages we are reading this week. As always, if you haven't started the book, you can find links in the description below where you can pick it up. The breakdown's down there, and you can also find the breakdown over on my website. But I hope you enjoyed these first set of chapters as much as I did. As confusing and twisted as it is, that's definitely part of the book. Um, and it's keeping me interested anyway. Um, so I hope, like I said, you're enjoying it like I am. And I'm going to leave you here. Happy reading, everyone. <laughs> Bye.